Hi everyone, this is the season of Orion. This is the time to take pictures of all of the beautiful celestial gems that are in the constellation. Things like this, the Great Orion Nebula. In fact, this very picture I took 13 years ago on the very night I am making this recording. And this image speaks to me in a number of different ways. It uh, has some very interesting astrophysical things going on, as well as the processing. And that is what I hope uh, you can take away from this video. I'd like to explain a few things that I think are important about the image processing of an object like the Orion Nebula. Uh, one of the interesting things about it is that this is an object that beginning imagers often point their telescope and camera at initially as a first thing to take a picture of. The logic is that the Orion Nebula is so bright that it should be a very easy object to, uh, to work with. And the irony is, it's not really. And it's not because mostly it has this huge range of colors, a very large range of brightnesses, and extremely small detail. If you want to encapsulate, to capture all of that kind of information, it is a big challenge. There are many other objects, though a bit fainter, that are actually easier to try to kind of put together in an image quickly uh, than something like this, the Great Orion Nebula. Its challenge truly is great. In fact, there is something in particular that's uh, very special about the nebula, and I call it the central problem, the central dilemma of the Orion Nebula. It literally is the center. In fact, if you look at pictures that people have taken of the Orion Nebula, say, I don't know, just Google the Orion Nebula, you'll find that uh, there are many, many pictures. And what they generally show are wonderful colors and details on the outer parts of the nebula. But then as you move closer and closer into the center, those colors and details uh, and brightnesses become either so overwhelming or they just lose information in terms of that detail and color. And that's one of the things that I have always thought is something that's important, is it is to retain that kind of information, especially within the heart, within the center of the Orion Nebula, it is the thing that makes all of the stuff surrounding happen in the very first place. So for me, that is my aesthetic. And there is actually a history, if you will, to the progression of how people have handled this uh, through time. It used to be that when amateurs would take pictures of the Orion Nebula and other bright things, but especially this nebula, you would uh, combine the information in a special way where people would create a kind of a, uh, a dimmer version of the nebula and then a really bright version and then use, say, something like masks in Photoshop, blending those two images together. And the thing is, it never worked, at least not in my opinion. Now, I know people spent a lot of time trying to make it work, but at the end of the day, you could always tell that someone combine these two images together to try to create a picture that looks like this. That is not how I created this particular image. That's the kind of thing I'd like to uh, demonstrate. But that's how it was done uh, was with Photoshop. Later, as people um, got other kinds of software, other possibilities became uh, available. One of the funny things about trying to blend images together the way that I described is because you can kind of tell, for me, that breaks the naturalness of an image. If you can tell what someone did, then I think that artifice kind of somehow interrupts. It's, it's something that takes your attention away from the beauty of the object. So uh, later, some kinds of software, in particular, I used to use a software called CCD Stack that allowed you to normalize the images. Uh, two different kinds of images, short and long exposures. You can scale them in such a way that you can make the short exposure as if it were the same um, exposure time, if you will, as the long one, but it wouldn't be overexposed. And though the faint parts of that short exposure would be noisy, that's not the part you blend in. You only blend in the very brightest parts of the short exposure. So you're actually using real data to blend these two images together and then you can do it mathematically. There is really very little in the way of artifice. You only have that threshold between the two images. And it was, it, this is how I did this particular image. It is impossible to tell where the two images are in some way 
uh, overlapping one another or combining. It's not that they're overlapping. They're actually being combined based on a threshold brightness. Only areas where one image was saturated, you are inputting or substituting the image of the other. Today, of course, with programs like PixInsight, there are even better tools that are available, tools like HDRMT and HDRMT uh, Composition, which does something very similar to what I just described, though it is done in a much more sophisticated manner. So hang on and let me show you some of these cool things about the images and how I approach them so that you can take away some interesting processing tips as well as a little bit of science. I mentioned a moment ago, one of the ways in which you can create a very large dynamic range image is to blend short and long exposures. It's not the only way, but it is one of the ways that it was done predominantly in the past to work on objects like um, the Orion Nebula. So, uh, you know, in the past I've done instructional videos for other software. This is before PixInsight even existed, and I worked on uh, or worked with CCD Stack. CCD Stack, then I still have all of this instructional content on my website. And if you look under techniques, one of the techniques is exactly the one I described. And I just, it's just for historical purposes. I'm going to show it to you right now here on the screen. So here we have a long exposure of, this is just the luminance of the Orion Nebula. This is what the, the grayscale image looks like. And what you'll notice here at the bottom is there are two images. We're actually looking at the short exposure here. I'll show you the long exposure. Um, although the exposure time says 20 seconds and five minutes, these images are the mean. They are the combined of many, many of these frames. I think the, uh, the long exposure one was 12 five minute exposures and the short one, I don't know. I can't remember how many, but it might've been like 12 again, 20 second exposures. Here's actually what the long exposure data looks like. And if I, I'm just, this is actually a video, so I'm scrolling ahead here in it so that you can see um, what it looks like. When displayed like this, it's easy to see the, all of the saturated parts of the nebula, not only the nebulosity, by the way, uh, in five minutes completely blown out, blows out the core, but also many, many stars are also equally blown out. So this technique that I'm about to demonstrate actually takes care of not only the, uh, you know, the saturated parts of the nebula, but also saturated stars. It's a cool technique. Here's just a closer look at the mess of the core. And in the short exposure, all of that information is contained within the data. So none of it is blown out here. You can see all the way down into the core. Um, unfortunately, even 20 seconds through this large telescope, uh, some of the stars do become uh, saturated. So they weren't perfect. Had I taken even shorter exposures, perhaps it would have been even better. This image might be, there you go. Uh, that was a mid image there. So anyway, this is what the short exposure looks like. And you can see wonderful resolution all the way down into the core. But if when you zoom out, you looked at all the faint stuff, it would all be very, very noisy because this is only the average of 20 second exposures. It's only the bright stuff that looks great. So this trick that I'm about to do here in CCD Stack is basically synonymous with what you do um, in uh, PixInsight, which is to scale the images. And this is going to be done in CCD Stack here by normalizing the images. What you end up doing is selecting a very small region here that encapsulates both the brightest and darkest parts of the image. So you can see now that I've drawn this box and it's gonna calculate the relative difference in signal strength between the two images because CCD cameras are linear detectors, you can do this. Once done, you can see down here, the scaling has occurred. Notice the weights here. If you take uh, 20 divided by 300, you'll get 0.0699 whatever here. That's just the relative signal strength because again, it's a linear detector. So now that the images are the same, you take the long exposure and you reject a range of values, all whatever you might choose to be called saturated values, just totally reject them. And in this program, you use a, a clever technique, which is called using missing value pixels. That's the process of rejecting them and basically making them non-pixels. It's as if they're transparent. And that's what happens when you do it such that now what you can do is combine these two images together and everywhere, this is the long exposure, 
Everywhere in this long exposure you see black, everything from the short exposure will be put in. And the short exposure has been scaled to the same signal strength as the long exposure. So everywhere here that's bright stuff, there is no detriment in the short exposure here because um, it's so bright the signal um, isn't going to be noisy or anything like that. But because I'm going to be averaging basically these two images together, they don't overlap all the stuff that's the missing value. That's where the short exposure stuff goes. So the weight of the short exposure would have been combined everywhere else, but what you can do is give it a weight of zero. Missing values have this special property that it'll have 100% of whatever the value is where you're substituting in these black areas, but everywhere else I want to make that value be a weight of zero so it has no impact at all. The long exposure will be the only thing expressed everywhere outside of these black pixels. So here you can see I've now combined the data together. You can see that I've changed the weight to be effectively zero. And uh, in the combined image, we are looking now at a picture that is um, uh, the combination of the long and short exposure data. So if we zoom out and we make it look kind of nice here, you would not be able to tell any kind of threshold or know in any way that this is the combination of two mathematically combined images. That's the technique that was employed, and this is, has a huge dynamic range because this is a 32-bit image. This exceeds the range of values of a 16-bit image, actually. So this image is a high dynamic range image that needs to be scaled or non-linearly adjusted in some way, uh, but that's exactly what I did. So uh, there you have it, the historical perspective of how it used to be done, at least in one particular program in a very, uh, I, I think, a, a great method. But now in PixInsight, everything that I just showed you is synonymous with the tools that are basically HDR uh, composition. The normalization that I did is basically a linear fit. And instead of linear fitting just one version of the, the short exposure and long exposure, you can do multiple uh, versions of that. And then you're creating kind of like these areas of blending that all go together. So now I can explain kind of what it all means, at least in terms of my philosophy in, in approaching these kinds of images. You can use software to mathematically blend these different kinds of exposures together or to compress the dynamic range in such a way that it allows you to see the detail and the color even in the brightest um, elements or aspects of an image. And uh, M42 is just the perfect example to demonstrate that. So at any scale that I work on images, I always uh, make certain that I am approaching the object without philosophy, even at this scale. And this is at five arc seconds per pixel. <laughs> so this is not a high resolution image scale at all. You can still see the ionization frontier. You can still see that the center has this blue information. It is not white all the way down into the core, even at this low resolution of an image, you can still compress the dynamic range in such a way, and this is what I demonstrate in my tutorials at adamblockstudios.com, uh, is how to approach that imaging um, uh, methodology in order to always obtain this kind of result. I challenge you to look at other pictures, and especially look in this region right here, and see what happens um, when um, that kind of attention isn't necessarily given to that part of the data set. Here's another fairly, this is a very old image actually. Uh, so my you know, imaging technique has changed through the years, but once again, this is a slightly larger scale and uh, we're starting to get more and more of that structure and detail, but I am still able to maintain the colors and the detail going all the way down into the heart of the nebula, even though the resolution is not super, super um, uh, refined. In the and finally, we can zoom into this high resolution image of the center of the Orion Nebula. And the main point that I wanted to make the, for making this video is, is really again about the management of the brightnesses and colors and details within the Orion Nebula, especially in the hardest, most challenging parts, the center, because there is so much more information there. The very center of the, 
the Orion Nebula is a little universe in and of itself. It's beautiful, although it's very complex. It might be actually hard to look at here. But one of the things that's interesting is that this kind of information, this is a broadband image. There are very few actual broadband images which show this level of detail in visible wavelengths of light. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope has wonderful resolution, infinitely more refined than I am showing here. But that's not a broadband image. This is a broadband image, just RGB color. So what does the center of the, you know, the Orion Nebula look like? In many images, you can't tell. And that's one of the reasons why I just go so crazy to try to maintain that information. This applies not only to, of course, the Orion Nebula, but many, many other kinds of objects that they too might have these very challenging bright areas with interesting structure or information contained within them. So I, that's, that's the idea I wanted to, to really get across here. And with this management of color and brightness and contrast, you can actually see some interesting things with regards to perhaps some astrophysics. Uh, if you don't manage those colors and brightnesses and details and so on, then a lot of this information gets lost within the complexity. For example, notice how there's some stars here. You'll notice these stars have little bubbles surrounding them. So stars that are embedded in these huge clouds of gas have stellar winds. They blow uh, the gas, once they're born, these natal clouds of gas, they blow them away and they make bubbles. But you'll notice these bubbles of gas, they are not centered on the star. Much of the structure that we see here is being, is being shaped by stellar winds of stars, most strongly, of course, by the stellar winds that are taking place here or coming from here. Uh, the trapezium stars are just, they're just monsters and they are blowing all of this gas and dust away that's why the bubbles of gas here are not centered on the stars. In fact, if you look closely here, you can even see there's a bow shock because this star is so close to the trapezium, it doesn't even get a chance to form a bubble. Instead, the clouds of gas that it has surrounding it that it blows out a little bit make a bow shock and are getting blown back behind it. I think that these are the kinds of interesting features that can easily be lost without that management of the brightness and the color using some particular kinds of techniques as I demonstrated. And as I mentioned, just to bring this up to date now, uh, within PixInsight, and this is going to be a video perhaps on its own at some later date, but you use HDR composition, and maybe even in combination with HDR multiscale transform, to do this management, to be able to have that detail and that color and be able to perhaps tell the story of the astrophysics of what's going on in the center of something as exciting as the Orion Nebula. I hope that you enjoyed this little deep dive, a little bit into the history of how people used to have to deal with this, what is done today, and why it might be important to do so. Thank you very much for joining me, and I hope to uh, do this again with you with another astrophotograph.